We do know uh, that when they left the, the Holy Land, uh, the order had increased in numbers and power. And by the beginning of the 1200s, they had returned to Europe, and the Knights Templar then became the dominant financial force in Europe. The Templars were the people that loaned the money. Well, of course, the popes and people to whom the money was, uh, they owned the money, they could get rid of their debt by getting rid of the Templars, and they did. But in addition to the issue of debt, the Templars were accused for embracing certain religious doctrines they had picked up during their time in the Holy Land. It is said they began to combine the teachings of Christianity with the influence of Islam and Judaism, as well as spin-off cults known as the Yazidi and the Hashashin. What people did not understand is they had adopted uh, the teachings of the ancient esoteric religions. And they were decreed by the Pope in 1308 in Europe and 1309 in England that the Templars should be disbanded, if not hunted down and killed. Many Templars were tortured under the Inquisition and even burned at the stake for heresy. But some of them escaped. And a lot of them, I think, went underground because by no means did the dragnet, if you will, capture all of them. A lot of them fled to Scotland. They had to go into hiding. And one of the places they found to hide was the um, Masonic Lodge. There's no question but that the Knights Templar are the real fulcrum of the latter development of Freemasonry. And that's not saying that Freemasonry did not pre-exist the Knights Templar. It did, as the builders, as guilds of builders throughout Europe. It is from the influence of the Knights Templar that many believe Masonry began to develop its modern philosophy. A philosophy literally carved in stone and found in one of the most intriguing monuments of the Western world. Just outside of Edinburgh, Scotland, is the Rossland Chapel, a place that may well provide a door to understanding Masonry, the Knights Templar, and the ancient plan for America. It very conclusively demonstrates a profound relationship between uh, Scotland and the Templars and the Freemasons, uh, which is not really any big revelation. Um, but of course, the whole idea is that, is that the three things go together. The chapel was built in the 15th century by William Sinclair. The tomb of his ancestor of the same name and who died a century earlier is found within. His name, as it appears, William St. Clair, Knight Templar, is believed to be a link between the Templars and the Scottish Masons who built this mysterious chapel. The chapel was, the foundation stone was laid in 1446 and it was finished about 1492. So it took 50 odd years to build. And the interesting fact is that um, William Sinclair, the builder, was 50 when the job started, and he died when it stopped. So this man was uniquely old, because in medieval times you wouldn't expect to live perhaps more than 35 years or so. But William Sinclair was into his 90s, so he was a remarkable character all the way around. Everything about him was remarkable, including the legacy he's left us. The legacy of Rosslyn Chapel seems to be the very essence of the Templar belief and that of secret societies everywhere. The removal of all boundaries concerning world religion. As noted before, this Gnostic theme is well captured in Dan Brown's best-selling book, The Da Vinci Code, a work that has created worldwide controversy. During our visit to Rosslyn Chapel, we encountered Erwin Lutzer, author of the book, The Da Vinci Deception. Of course, as we know, Roslyn Chapel has become famous because of the Da Vinci Code. And you have people coming from all over the world, staring at its ceilings, trying to crack its codes. As we walk through it, it's very probable that the Masons who built it had a field day. Uh, they decided that they were going to combine all kinds of uh, mythological elements along with the Bible so you have uh, Masonic elements in the chapel, 
you have some pagan elements, you have Christian elements, and they're all thrown together. Roslyn Chapel is probably one of the most extraordinary buildings in the world. Uh, it is like a Disneyland of masonry and Rosicrucianism. I think the chapel is an enigma. It satisfies the needs of a great number of people who come to Roslyn for a whole raft of reasons. If you're a, a Knight Templar or a Freemason, if you are an American looking for some links with the New World before it was discovered, if you're a Sinclair, if you're religious or a, an art historian or an architectural historian, an esoteric, Roslyn has got something for you. If you're a paganist, we have over 110 green men. Most churches will have one or two green men, but we have over a hundred of them. The green man is a representation of an ancient fertility god, just one of the many pagan icons in the chapel. And so Roslyn, not only does it offer a great many things to different people, but it also offers a mystery. The mystery, he explains, is that Roslyn Chapel, while designed as a Christian church, is filled with so many religious symbols, a person is confused about what they are compelled to worship. It's like, it's like having a VCR. You know pretty much what it's meant to do, but you can't actually make it work properly. No one can follow the instructions. And the chapel is like that. We know it's a church. That's fair enough. But it has so many other little stories connected with it and mysteries, and the carvings are not particularly clear. And they can be interpreted one way or another. And so for everything you see in the chapel, there's probably three answers. And that, I think, is its great appeal. Centuries after its construction, researchers continue to question the overarching message of the chapel. What was the intent of its design? It may have had a point for the Masons who made it in the sense that uh, there were various messages that were conveyed. Essentially, Masonry's doctrine foundationally, and they will even say this publicly, is universalism which is the idea that basically all religions are the same. It doesn't matter what religion you are, as long as you're sincere and devout in your beliefs, and that, that all, all men, they say, may gather at the hospitable altars of masonry no matter what their religious belief. So in that sense, they're very much part of, of pushing toward a one world religion and to, to, view, to view biblical Christianity as basically the enemy because biblical Christianity makes unique, unique claims about itself that, that none of these other groups, the Rosicrucians, the Masons, any of these groups will acknowledge. Some of us are convinced it's important that Christianity be held distinct from some of the elements that are found here in Rosalind Chapel. After all, the message of Jesus Christ is very, very unique. But throughout history, you've always found those who want to blend together various ideas, various organizations, and various religions. And here at the Roslyn Chapel, people can come and they can practically see anything that they want. But within the monument is evidence, not only of what the Templars and Masons came to believe, but perhaps a reflection of things to come. The promise of a land where one day their ancient hope might be fulfilled. For inside Rosslyn Chapel, along with the haunting imagery, is evidence of the new world prior to the discovery of Columbus. Well, there is, uh, there is this window which, uh, which is decorated, uh, the window frame is decorated with Indian corn or maize, and the chapel was built in the 15th century so it is, it is strange that Indian corn, which wasn't ever uh, grown here, uh, is used as a motif. The chapel was finished around 1492, the same year Columbus is thought to have come to America. This would mean the carvings would have been completed beforehand. But how did the Masons who built this chapel have knowledge of Indian corn, a crop not grown in Europe and indigenous to the New World? Who knows? There are lots of mysteries about this chapel. Another mystery is the presence of Aloha cactus plants, also indigenous to America, and like the Indian corn carved along the arches of the chapel. 
but even with these, academics have been skeptical. Yet a third carving, a trefoil plant, or type of clover, is said by Rosslyn Chapel director Stuart Beatty to have convinced one skeptic in particular. The, the trefoil plant is quite interesting. Um, Rosslyn Chapel does have carvings of plants that we believe came from the New World before Columbus discovered America. Uh, we've, we've had these plants investigated and a botanist from the university had a good look at them and he, he wasn't particularly convinced as academics need to be, he wasn't 100% sure that these plants were in fact aloe cactus and sweet corn. And I think his, his logic was that the, the people who went to the New World and recorded these images on parchment brought those images back, they would have been translated to wood and then subsequently translated to stone. And it's that process which removes them from the original two or three times, which means that there are discrepancies that can build in. And so being an academic, he, he was uncomfortable with these images. And uh, when looking around the chapel, he suddenly, his, his eyes lit up and he came and got me and he said, whilst I was fairly unsure about the sweet corn and aloe cactus as being honestly genuine, I have found a trefoil plant on what would have been the outside of the chapel at the time, but is now the baptistry, that would only have been found in the New World. Therefore, I am much more comfortable to say that the other plants are also honest and true. When the Templars were arrested in Europe, Many of them are said to have escaped with a great fleet of ships that were never to be found. Could they have made their way to the New World? If so, they could have handed down this knowledge through secret societies to men like Francis Bacon and before him, Christopher Columbus. Some, some people believe that Columbus didn't just accidentally stumble onto America, that uh, some secret society which he had access to uh, had knowledge of the existence of, uh, of the continent of both North and South America. Was Christopher Columbus a member of a secret order? Some researchers point to this painting that depicts Columbus with his left hand in a Kabbalistic gesture, denoting the left-hand path of the initiate meaning the path of darkness or secrecy. In addition, the ships of Columbus sailed to the New World adorned with red crosses on a white background, the symbol of the Knights Templar. Columbus's wife was the daughter of a famous Knights Templar line that passed along what are called porto lands and cartographs that Columbus had direct access to. And we know that he robbed the Portuguese and brought all of those portal lands to Isabella and Ferdinand. Um, w what I'm suggesting is that there, the, uh, people knew about this new Atlantis. They, they knew at the time of Columbus and before the time of Columbus. But did the secret societies involved view the new world as Atlantis of old? And if so, from where did they develop this idea? Was it only from Plato's account? Or from a belief more deeply rooted in America's secret history? In his groundbreaking book, America BC, Harvard professor Barry Fell reveals the presence of ancient Europeans in New England and the American Midwest as far back as 800 BC. The author uncovers evidence of ancient Celts and Druids with travelers from Spain, Libya, Carthage, Rome, and Egypt, all of whom came to the New World centuries prior to its so-called discovery by Columbus. His research exposes that the all-seeing eye was present in places like Vermont and New Hampshire long before the new order of the ages was declared. Does this stand as proof that America was indeed known by the ancients and that its destiny has been the plan of secret societies from long ago? The cornerstone of the White House was laid on October 13, 1792. 
The architect for the White House was an Irishman named James Hoban, who took his design from Leinster House in Ireland. Since 1922, Leinster House has been headquarters for the Irish Parliament, but before that was known as the first Masonic Lodge in Ireland. In 1307, the Knights Templar were betrayed in Europe by the Pope and the King of France. By now, it is well known that they fled to Scotland for refuge, hiding themselves in Masonic Lodges. Yet according to 18th century Masonic author, Baron Karl von Hunt, certain Templar leaders made their way to Ireland before they reorganized and formed their well-known power base in Scotland. The Knights had a foothold in Ireland since about the 13th century through their banking operations and would have likely gone underground to protect themselves once the persecutions began. What we do know is that centuries passed and in time Leinster House became the birthplace of Irish Freemasonry with obvious connections to the Knights Templar. Leinster House was once called Kilwinning Lodge No. 75 or the High Knights Templar of Ireland. James Hoban, the architect for the White House, was himself an Irish Freemason. But the White House cornerstone bears a further Templar twist. The Charleston City Gazette reported that the date recorded by the Freemasons for laying the first stone read the 13th day of October 1792 in the 17th year of the independence of the United States of America. It just so happens that October 13, 1792 was the 485th anniversary of Black Friday, Friday the 13th, when the Knights Templar were overthrown in Europe. The numbers 4, 8, and 5 equal 17 for the 17th year of America's independence. Meanwhile, the day before, on October 12th of 1792, was the first celebration of Columbus Day in America and supposedly commemorates how Christopher Columbus sailed for 33 days before he made his first landfall in the New World. A statue honoring Christopher Columbus is found outside Union Station in Washington, D.C. The Columbus Monument declares that it was the faith and courage of Christopher Columbus that gave to mankind a new world. Yet for years, researchers have wondered why American historians have given such credit to Columbus when there were others who had reached the new world earlier. Columbus in 1492 only, only got as far as the Caribbean islands. Even the ceiling of the state capitol acknowledges the coming of the Vikings. Historians argue that Leif Erikson made it to the New World some 500 years before Columbus. You do have history. It's, you just don't recognize it. Or could it be that the recognition is intended to represent something else? After all, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, he did so with sails bearing a red cross on a white background, the symbol of the Knights Templar. These same ships are found painted on the interior ceiling of the U.S. Capitol 